Welcome to my YouTube channel, Rick Sorot's Watercolor. If after watching this video you have questions, one of the best sources of information is my website, rsorotsart.com. I'm frequently asked questions about my materials. One of the best sources for that information is the studio page of my website. I'm also often asked about classes and workshops, and you can go to the workshop page on my website and see what uh, workshops are scheduled and upcoming. And if you have specific questions, you can comment on the video or you can email me at contactrsirwitzart at gmail.com. Enjoy the video. Welcome to the narrated step-by-step -step tutorial for my painting, Beaver Marsh Lily Pad. This was painted on a quarter sheet of 140 pound cold press Lanaquarel watercolor paper. The photograph on the right was my reference and inspiration for this painting. However, I opted to make a number of composition changes before I began my painting. In the photograph, the flower is in the center of the composition, which isn't very good design, so I opted to move my flower more to the right and up more towards the top using the rule of thirds, and I located it in the top right quadrant. In the bottom left hand corner of the photograph, there's a lily pad which I opted to leave out and leave a larger shape of water. On the bottom right corner of the photograph, there's a lily pad in the, the V kind of cutaway shape that appears in lily pads is directed towards the bottom right corner, creating a tangent. I didn't like that, so I opted to actually place two overlapping lily pads with the direction of that, that V-shape changed uh, instead of uh, representing it as it is in the photograph. I also added a lily pad just underneath the flower and I like the interesting shape that's created by the large water shape and the arrangement of the lily pads. Because I moved the flower itself up towards the top right quadrant, I for, had to change the foreshortening a little bit of the lily pads in the top right corner and they appear more foreshortened than they do in the photograph. So the end result that you see is my interpretation of this photograph with design changes made that and through my eyes improve the composition. Here I've done a light sketch with a B pencil that incorporates the composition changes that I made. I'm going to begin my painting by working with the water shapes throughout the composition. And if you look at the photograph, while there, if you look close, there's some reflection of the sky tones being picked up. There's slight indications of blue. And when you're actually here at this marsh, there are some areas where you can see some large ref reflection, area shapes of reflection of the blue sky. But in this photograph, it's a fairly murky brownish green. Well, I've opted to make my interpretation of this be more representative of the, the sky reflection. So I'm going to begin painting with a mixture of cerulean blue and manganese blue. So here again, this is going to be my interpretation of this subject matter. Now I'm picking up the water shapes and I'm using a one inch flat brush. This is a, a silver black velvet brush and it does a nice job uh, keeping a clean edge when you're applying some of these washes. And you can put down a wide stroke or a, a narrow stroke, such as here where I'm working in between these lily pads, just be by uh, changing the angle of the brush. Keep in mind, as I apply this wash, my board is at a 15 to 20 degree angle. So I'm letting gravity work for me, and I know which way my paint's going to flow. So I'm working from the top to the bottom. And here I've started to work in some cobalt violet. And because my board's at an angle and I'm working with gravity, I'm getting a nice gradation of the blue into the cobalt violet. Another thing I'll point out, if you've watched some of my other videos, you've heard me talk about my painting process and how I like to start with large brushes, large shapes, and I start working towards the smaller shapes. So here I'm defining the larger shapes in this composition by applying this wash uh, in, in what is actually the water shapes, but it starts to define the lily pads because the 
uh, the water in relationship to the, the lily pads is negative space and it starts to define those positive shapes as I paint around them. I also like to have some softer edges early in my painting process so I'm going to take this fine mist spray bottle here and I'm just going to touch some of these areas and soften up the edges just a bit. As I'm doing this, I've worked fast enough that my paper is still saturated, so I, I'm not worried about getting a backwash. If I waited too long before I came in and did this, I would be uh, at a greater risk of having some blossoms and backwash. If you look at the photograph, there's this nice fresh yellow tone on the flower, uh, kind of towards the, the bottom where the petals change direction and in the, the center of the flower. And I want to keep that freshness, so I'm going to put this in early in my painting process while I have a nice, uh, clean, white area to, to put this tone on. So um, it'll be nice and fresh. If I start working with some glazes and, and I lose that white, it's going to be hard to, to put that nice, fresh yellow tone in there. So I've put some yellow paint, and it's actually uh, gamboge that I'm using and I've got a just a, a smaller general purpose sable brush that I'm using to put this tone in and I so I take that gamboge and I just give a hint of it and uh, towards the bottom then I softened it with the, the spray and diffuse that color a little bit in the top it's a little bit more uh, has to do with the structure of the flower so it's not it's going to be a harder edged shape there in that area this is where the, the planning elements come in. You have to think about your painting process and especially when you're talking about preserving the whites and lights of your paper and follow a logical sequence as you build up the layers. There, there's reasons for defining painting areas to define larger shapes and, and put down a tone that starts to bring harmony throughout your painting. Um, there, there's reasons to paint an area such as this uh, at the point I am while my paper is fresh and I can put this this nice fresh tone down and diffuse it and uh, it gives me the result I'm after and I don't I don't have to I can't come back in later after I maybe have put some glazes over this area and put this fresh tone down because I won't get that nice reflection of light coming from the paper through the paint at that point so I have some of these yellow highlights on the flower and now I'm going to start working some of that brighter yellow tone into the lily pads themselves. So what I have here is some of this gamboge but I've added a touch of sap green to the mixture. So here you can see I'm taking some of this bright yellow tone and I'm carrying it into the leaf shape of the lily pad. And uh, the sap green that I'm working in here, uh, initially it's mixed some with the gamboge and I have a stronger green tone here and I've put just a touch of pyro red in the green to uh, make it not as raw as out of the tube, but not very much. You can see here how that gamboge has uh, gradated into the sap green and and made a nice transition for this overall shape i have that kind of a, a nice warm yellow tone just gradually gradating into more of a green tone and now i'm picking up that yellow green on the other side of uh, that lighter shape that i've indicated there which is actually the turned up edge of the lily pad the brush that I was using there is a little small, um, so I've gone to a larger brush. I've got the, uh, it's, a, it's a, another silver black velvet brush I like. It's a nice wash brush. It's a jumbo round small. And um, I'm working with this, the same uh, yellow green tone here and adding some water to soften that edge and gradate that to a lighter tone on that particular lily pad. And in here I put a little bit more yellow 
just to give that touch of a yellow highlight into that leaf. And as I work through my, my painting process, I'm going to build up layers on top of these areas that I'm painting right now on these lily pads. I'm going to continue that wash down. And, and you can see, more often than not, I'm working from the top to the bottom. Here is another, uh, in the end, it's a large um, wash of this yellow-green tone that I'm working into these lily, lily pad shapes and the one runs right into the other and I'm treating it like a large wash. Here I've put a touch of cerulean blue into my mixture to bring in uh, a cool element. So to this point it's all been uh, on the lily pad it's been pretty much warm tones I've been using. Now I'm bringing in some cerulean blue to bring in that uh, contrast of warm and cool. Working with the same color mixtures with gamboge, sap green, and cerulean blue, I'm going to come in and put uh, a wash on these other lily pad shapes. So I still have this jumbo round small wash brush. And uh, I'm, again, you can see that I'm pretty much working from the top to the bottom. And I'm applying these same color mixtures into these other lily pad shapes. I'm going to get uh, this bottom right corner, this lily pad shape here, again using the same color mixtures. And here I'm starting at the top of this shape and letting the, the paint uh, work with gravity and flow down so that allows me to achieve this gradation as I change my colors in the same wash um, because I'm working at an angle that paint just flows and gradates nicely from one end to the other and here I'm just going to soften that up a little bit I'm going to start working on the, the back side of this flower and this lily pad shape I'm still using this wash brush but you can see as I paint this how the flower starts to come forward, the positive shape of the flower. So the relationship of this lily pad and the flower is a positive-negative relationship. And that lily pad is a negative shape, uh, ha uh, shares a negative edge with this flower. So it, by painting that lily pad, I further define the shape of the flower. I'm going to begin painting this. Uh, one lily pad that hasn't been done. Before I could do that, I wanted to make sure that that other shape was dry so I didn't get a backwash. I didn't have this run one into the other and have a defined edge there. And if I had tried to paint that when that other shape was wet, I would have got unwanted backwash. As I work my way around uh, some of these other areas that I want to put this tone in, uh, again, I waited to uh, some of these other areas were dry before I came back in and put the washes in. So some of these areas here where those edges um, line up against uh, some shapes with different tones, I needed to make sure that those were dry before I came in and put this other wash in. And so far in this painting, I've only used a few colors. I've used the cerulean and manganese blue as I put down my, my wash of the water shapes, and I worked in some cobalt violet. And then the, the leafy shapes, the lily pads themselves, and in the flower, I've used gamboge, sap green, and again, I've used some cerulean blue in some of that too. So basically, about five colors that I've used at this point. I'm going to begin putting another layer of tone on some of these lily pad shapes to start to contour uh, the structure of the lily pad a little bit. And to do that, I'm just putting another layer of the same tones that I've been working with. So this mixture here is the gamboge with sap green. And here I'm going over top of some of that, the, the cooler area that I painted with a little cerulean blue in there. And softening that up a little bit with the spray but you can see that just those brush strokes on top 
building another layer starts to define uh, kind of the, the structure of that leaf. And you can see where the veins start to, to show where I've left uh, the, the initial wash alone. I'm going to start working on the flower to bring some more definition to the flower itself. And uh, the one comment I'll make is that so at this point in my painting process, I really have only gone to light to middle value uh, on the value scale. I've yet to introduce any really dark values into my painting process. And this is a common way that I start my painting, starting with light values and middle values. and, and uh, starting to block in some of my larger shapes and then I'll start to build my values and start to build more uh, detail and give more definition to the painting as I go further in my painting process. Here I'm putting a, a light yellow tone around some of the flower shapes and expanding that kind of a, a warm glow and to do that I'm actually starting to work with Naples yellow just a light wash of Naples yellow which is a very muted uh, yellow. I'm going to start to work some cooler tones into some of these flower petals and the, the shadowed side of the flower is actually on the side of the flower closest to the viewer so it's more in the foreground and I'm using a mixture of uh, cerulean blue with a little bit of cobalt violet in it and then a little bit of royal blue mixed in to, to deepen the color just a little bit. But it still has quite a bit of water in it, and it's still very much a middle value. If I add a lot of royal blue, it's going to darken it up quite a bit and make a very deep value. But um, you just have to uh, balance the mixture. to It, it gives a, a little bit of a purple tone into the blue, um, but, it's, but with the... Uh, Diluting it with the water keeps it still on the light side. So at this point I've done quite a bit of uh, brushwork along the flower with this blue bluish purple tone. And uh, I'm going to continue to define some of these petals. So this the, the side of the flower that's closest to us has that uh, sh that bluish purple shadow and it helps enhance that kind of yellow glow that's on the other side of those petals um, because you have the play of complements there with the with the uh, purple tone and the yellow so here I'm just making some decisions on where, where I want to put some uh, touches of this uh, this violet around the edges and uh, I don't want to overdo it, but just give just enough to give the suggestion of edge and shadows and give some definition to the individual petals of this flower. And some of these tones just run together um, from petal to petal. So if you look on the, the bottom right of this flower, you can see how even though there's different petals there, it's one tone and it just starts to become one larger shape more than just an individual petal. I'm going to uh, take a kneaded eraser now and I'm going to erase my pencil marks. Uh, the more you paint over the pencil marks the harder they are to remove and I don't want to, although it doesn't bother me to have some pencil marks left in my paintings because uh, it's hard to get rid of them all, I, I want to try and uh, get rid of as much as possible in this flower so I can keep the softer edges and not have uh, the pencil marks. So I'm going to stop and take the time to erase uh, the pencil marks that I have on my painting at this point. You're going to see almost immediately as I start to make this brush stroke that I am starting to work with much darker values here. So to this point everything has been very much a light middle value and now I'm going to come in I'm going to start to um, paint some sharper edges and start to bring some more definition to my composition and right now I'm using a mixture of sap green with pyrrole red in it and just a touch of royal blue 
you can see here I'm putting some of this darker tone around the edge of this flower to start to send it forward and uh, I use a spray bottle to soften the edge just a little bit at this point still. Now here I'm, I'm going to work around this flower to start to bring some definition to it and I'll make a comment here about when you are painting and, and putting down paint and making brush marks you need to have a reason when you make a brush marker there's no reason to make it so when, when you're putting down your paint be thinking about why you're making that particular brush mark in this instance as I'm placing these dark values or, around my composition around this flower I'm, I'm doing it to help start to define edges so I'm, I'm putting the, the placement of these darker values in areas where I want to bring an edge forward or send an area back and start to create some depth in my painting so um, I have a specific purpose for putting some of these marks down and um, I try and maintain that mentality throughout my painting process keep in mind as I'm as I'm working on my painting here that um, this is my interpretation of the subject and at this point I still use the photograph for reference and to get ideas but I'm guided just as much by just uh, principles of design and composition as I am the photograph so a lot of the decisions I'm making at this point are design based and not necessarily trying to, to render something I see in the photograph so I'm making decisions on positive and negative negative edges uh, dark and light shapes I'm trying to send some areas back and bring other shapes forward but I'm thinking more in terms of shape and direction and harmony and balance and dominance and and principles and elements of design are guiding me more than uh, the photograph at this point earlier when I started to do some brushwork around this flower and mentioned how you can see now I was going to a darker value I think some people felt that I was at my darkest dark at that point but really it was only a dark middle value to that point I had been working with light middle values and then I started to introduce some dark middle value around that flower and it really stood out however now you can see that I could still go much darker on the value scale than what I had and I think one of the shortcomings sometimes people have that keep them from fully realizing the potential of a painting is they don't fully explore the value range they stop at that middle value um, and think that they're at their darkest dark and you and, and they're not uh, close to fully exploring the full range of the value scale so you can see here as I place some of these darks besides these whites and lights that there's quite a bit of contrast and I, I, I didn't have that level of contrast earlier in my painting process so that's something you got to think about and it doesn't hurt to have a, a value checker where you've made a scale of values um, on a separate little sheet of paper and uses a checker to put against your painting and and help guide you on how far you fully explored the the value scale often as I move through my painting process and I start to introduce my darker values I start to uh, work with the darker values around my center of interest first and this is what I'm doing here is I'm starting to build my values and some of my strongest contrast in the area that I want to be my focal point or center of interest so I'm placing some of these very dark tones beside some of these uh, lights and white areas to give me uh, some strong contrast around my center of interest and the mixture that I'm using is a mixture of sap green with pyro red and royal blue I use that mixture a lot when I'm working with greens and I use the, the uh, royal blue to help darken the value of the color and as I as I work with this painting um, and I, I start to get into this water I'm going to use a, a, a mixture which has a, uh, a heavy influence of the uh, royal blue and the sap green those two colors together make a, a real nice blue green color and it's one of my favorite mixtures is the sap green and the royal blue and uh, it just comes up with a very nice uh, pleasing blue green tone so I'm taking this this blue green mixture that I have and it's very dark value 
and I'm kind of bouncing, starting to bounce around my composition a little bit. And uh, I'm placing these darker values in areas where it starts to, to help the fine edges and start to bring clarity to the shapes. And um, while in the, I, early on in my process, I painted the water shape with an with a overall wash, uh, and then I've painted the lily pads, they're all still about the same value. And even though I have a change of color, I don't have a change in value. So now I'm strategically moving around my composition, placing some of these darker values to help define the shapes more. So here again, I have a purpose for the brush marks I'm making. And something I just stated that I want to reinforce is sometimes people think because they've changed color, uh, they, they feel they've uh, had the impact of a value change and they haven't. If you can see the lily pad in the water that I'm working on right now, that lily pad, there, there's really not much definition between the lily pad and the water. It's a color change, but it's not a change in value. So until I start changing my value, I really don't have a strong definition of shape there. I've defined them by color, but I really haven't uh, started to create any depth and I haven't started to send anything back. So sometimes people think color change equals value change and that's not the case. You can change colors but stay in the same value and if you squint your eyes you're barely going to be able to tell that you've, you've done anything there and, it'll, and it won't define any edges or shapes or anything just sometimes by a color change without changing value. As I mentioned a number of times I'm painting my interpretation of this photo and of this subject matter and one of the big decisions I made was to make the water uh, more of a sky tone and more reflecting, reflecting the color of the sky and, and, and use a blue green tone rather than the kind of murky brown green in this photo. I could have gone the other way and, and been more literal with my color choices but I wanted a fresher look for my painting. So I'm going to so, show three uh, different paintings in succession here where I vary the approach uh, from my subject matter and from my interpretation. So this is a painting where I've picked up a sky tone, but I've been more literal with the reflections and picking up the colors of the rocks. Very similar here where I have the flow of the water and the splashing with a lot of white and some blue reflection, but I also have the brown tones that I've carried through. And in this one, I have just a touch of a sky tone, but I've been more literal with the, the browns and greens that I use in this photograph. My point is, it's up to you how you interpret your subject and how you use your reference material. If you want to do a, a realistic uh, interpretation and follow the, the photograph very closely, there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to go in a different direction, there's nothing wrong with that. It's up to you how you're going to interpret and represent your subject matter. The one thing I would caution is no matter which way you go, whether it's in another direction or if it's more realistic, make sure you don't ignore the principles and elements of design and follow good rules of composition. Next, I want to strengthen the, the green tone that I have on these lily pad shapes. So I've got my wash brush and I've got a mixture of sap green with a little bit of pyrrole red and um, I'm, I'm putting in a wash and then I'm going to diffuse that color a little bit away from the edges of the flower using my fine mist sprayer. Here my process when I do this is to come in with the, the tone that I'm putting down around the edge and then I come in with a fine mist spray and I diffuse that color spraying away from uh, the edge that I'm trying to define. So as I spray this, what's not so obvious is I kind of get close to the paper and then I move away from the edge that I'm trying to find as I'm spraying. So I kind of start close to the edge and low and then I move away and lift my bottle up farther away as I go. 
you'll notice I often come in with the tissue and pick up that excess water because if I don't pay attention to that, it's going to sit and it's going to cause some backwash. The one thing about using this spray bottle, I have to keep it pretty full. Um, I really keep it within about an inch of the top because if I don't, uh, when I start turning it on its side and start spraying and moving away, uh, I'll get I'll get intermittent spray and I'll get air at points. So uh, I try to keep it within about an inch of the top so I don't get an un, don't get an interrupted spray when I'm using it. This tone that I'm putting down now is a mixture of royal blue and sap green with the, the biggest part of the ratio leaning towards royal blue. And I'm putting down these kind of random marks and then coming in with a spray bottle to soften them to give the suggestion of a reflection of uh, and feeling of clouds. So I've, I've kind of put that random pattern in there and I come in with a spray bottle and I've softened it. And, and the one thing you want to keep in mind is when the, the watercolor dries it, it can lighten up quite a bit so uh, this is fairly dark right now but when it's dry it's going to be a, a much lighter tone but i'm just trying to give the suggestion of uh, the reflection of clouds and the reflection of the sky tone and I'm also at the same time starting to deepen my values in some of these areas but some of them I don't want to have a hard edge contrast I just want to have softness so that's what I've done there in that lower left hand corner I'm going to do some brushwork around uh, the flowers and the lily pads uh, with a darker value to start to, to further define the shape start to sun some areas back and bring other areas forward Here I'm going to take a mixture of sap green and pyrrole red with a little bit of royal blue in it, the same mixture I've been using. And I'm using it now to define the edge of that lily pad. So I put that darker value along the edge and then I'm going to come in with my spray bottle. I'm going to soften that on the, the side moving away from the, the edge I'm trying to define. I'm going to start to build some layers here uh, using the same mixture, just a little darker value, the sap green and pie roll red with a little royal blue in there. And I've got my wash brush and it's a very fluid mixture. So when I'm painting like this I mix large puddles of paint on my palette. I'm continuing on with the same wash, uh, putting a darker, uh, kind of a dark middle value on some of these other leaves here at the top. And you can see it doesn't bother me that sometimes they let these run together as one shape. I'll use small dark value marks later through my process to, to further define edges on some of these. Now I'm taking a mixture of the royal blue and sap green and it makes a nice this nice dark rich blue green tone and I'm using my wash brush and I'm giving the indication of uh, kind of the ripples in the water there and that whole shape up there in the top left corner I want to be a darker value so I'm going to pretty much paint that shape this dark value with uh, some touches of, of light reflecting in what would be the ripples of the water. I'm taking that same tone and uh, putting some touches of that value in some other areas in the composition. It just helps balance that uh, the composition out helps uh, bring some harmony to what's going on there. I don't want to isolate it in the one corner. So I'm, I'm bringing the value and the, uh, the blue-green tone that I use in that top left corner. I'm going to take some of that value and put it down 
in this low, lower quadrant, lower left quadrant. And just as a continuation of what I have going on up above it there in the top corner. So the same value, same color, and some of the same shape making that I'm doing with my brush. So some of the very similar brush work to give the indication of some ripples, but I'm not going to carry it too far down into this area. I'm going to leave it uh, dominant light in that area. I've reached a point in my process where I'm going to do some brush work where I, where I take uh, a dark value, make some small brush marks uh, throughout my composition to help the fine edges and shapes. It gets very repetitive. So for this segment, I'm going to speed things up at 3x speed, and then I'll stop it and resume narration at normal speed shortly thereafter. So now I'm back to normal speed and uh, I've worked around the whole composition putting some uh, darker values and very small brush marks um, and, and attempted to further define uh, edges and shapes and in a lot of areas it doesn't take much of a mark to define an edge and now I'm taking this darker value and I'm putting it on top of this leaf and starting to create a pattern uh, on top of this leaf that's representative of the uh, structure of the leaf. And this nice dark value here helps uh, provide a nice contrast to the, to the white petals that it's right beside. So uh, again, it's, it's my center of interest, my focal point where I'm trying to get some of the greatest value contrast in my overall composition. I've moved on to this second lily pad where I'm doing similar brushwork to to the other one here. So I'm again I'm creating a pattern here with this darker value on top of the uh, tones that I had probably put down prior, and it just gives a suggestion of the structure of the leaf of the lily pad, and it still lets some of that underlying tone come through and some of the, the variation of the wash that I have underneath it. I won't have the same level of detail on all the lily pads. I'm going to vary that uh, that level of detail and I'll have uh, more detailed um, brushwork around my center of interest. In some of the areas I'll leave with less brushwork 
and leave it up for the viewer to decide what's going on, but it gives the eye a place to rest. I'm going to come in with a, a slightly darker value, a cool tone on the shadowed side of the flower petals. And this is a mixture with the royal blue and uh, a little bit of the cobalt violet mixed in. But it's been diluted some with water, so it's not quite uh, as dark as it could be with a mixture that's mostly royal blue. And you can see that I'm using the same wash brush that I had been using. And I'm making these marks with just a nice brush stroke and leaving it alone. I'm not fiddling around with a small brush and making a bunch of little little dotted marks. Uh, I'm just making a nice even tone, putting down a nice even wash, and, and just leaving it. As I've made some of these brush marks, they run together. And as long as I do that in a timely manner, I'm fine because the paper's saturated and it hasn't had enough time to set an edge. If I waited too long and came back and, and started putting brush marks adjacent to it that ran into uh, an area that was already starting to set an edge and partially dry, I'd risk getting some backwash or blossoms. But as long as I'm doing it at the same time where, where it's still saturated, uh, I won't have any problem with that. I want these lily pads to uh, be a slightly darker value in, in this uh, whole side of the paper here. So I'm coming in with a darker value wash on top of it. And I'm giving some indication of the structure of the lily pad, but not near the, the level of detail that I did on the first two. So I gave an indication of, uh, of that raised center area of the lily pad and I'm giving some indication of edges and some rolled edges there, but I'm not uh, putting much detail. So while uh, I've given a, just a hint, uh, a suggestion of some of the leaf structure, I'm really not putting any level of detail in there. When I apply some of these washes on these though, I do try to contour the, the surface of, of what I'm painting to give an indication structure. I'm going to take a coarse uh, spray bottle and just spritz that wash back there and um, what it's going to do is just give some uh, a pattern of droplets in that uh, that wash I just put and when you when you look at the lily pads, there's this this random discoloration within the leaf. So I'm just kind of trying to suggest that with that spritz of water on that wash. And now I'm going to uh, do the same to the uh, this lily pad here to the left. And here again, here's an example where I'm trying to contour uh, the shape of that leaf with my brush strokes, just to give a slight indication of what's going on. And um, it's going to be subtle uh, on this one, a little bit more subtle than it is on uh, the first two by the flower that I did. Because I don't want to have the same level of detail, but I'm just giving a suggestion of what's there. And now I'm going to spritz them a little bit and blot it with a tissue to lighten it up a little. I want the, the slower corner to be a darker value. So I'm taking a darker mix of the sap green and pyrrole red. And uh, I'm going to tone that down a little bit. So I'll apply this darker tone underneath that flower that I'm going to uh, spray it with a, a spray bottle to soften that up. So as I do this, I'm diffusing that color and I'm getting that paper pretty wet. So if I want to add some more color to it because it's wet now, I'm going to I can come in with that tone and apply it without any risk of a blossom because I'm now I'm painting wet into wet and the paper is fully saturated. So I can continue that wash down at this point. I 
I want to pick up a little bit of that pattern that I have in some of those leaves just a little bit here on this one and um, you know, the decisions that I'm making right now really um, don't don't have uh, much to do with my uh, reference photo. I, I haven't really looked at that much at all um, for a while. Right now I'm, what I'm doing is designing with shapes and space and making decisions based on what I feel uh, would uh, add to the overall composition and design and less what what I'm seeing in the photograph. Taking some more of that dark blue green value and uh, making a, a, a bit of a shape here uh, to help tie the uh, left side and the right side of this composition together with this darker value. I felt, I felt it was feeling a little separated there, so this dark value helps bring the two sides together, I feel. I'm going to continue for a while here making the, some darker valued marks in some, some areas around the whole composition to further define edges and help create a balance of, of my, my darker values in my composition. So I'm just going to continue with some of this brushwork. Now I want to try and add a vertical element to this composition just to provide some interest. I know by being familiar uh, with the subject matter and its surroundings and being there that in various areas there's pieces of grass that stick up and actually in my photograph there's, like, there's a little bit of a twig that sticks up but there's more of that going on and I want to try and include some of that in my composition. It's not in my photo but uh, I'm familiar with the surroundings and of the subject matter and uh, I'm going to uh, take a, a brush here with clear water and I'm going to lift and drag some of that color over some of the lighter areas just to create that vertical element, that grassy element. And, and after I've done a little bit of this, I'm going to come back in with a rigger brush and I'm going to make some marks that give the indication of these kind of uh, vertical uh, linear marks that, are, that represent uh, grassy shapes or twigs sticking out of the water. Now I've switched to my rigger brush and this is a small rigger brush and I have a darker value here and I'm just given a slight indication of some of these grassy uh, shapes, some of these linear shapes um, that provides a little bit of verticality and, and more th makes it a little bit, I feel the whole composition a little bit more three-dimensional just with a suggestion of these vertical shapes. The other thing I'm doing to help uh, add dimension to this is by putting these marks in I'm creating areas of overlap and just overlap by its nature helps provide some depth and dimension. And that's my painting Beaver Marsh Lily Pad. I'm going to put a white mat around it so you can get a better look at it. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you get a chance, check out Rick Soros Watercolor Friends and Subscribers on Facebook. And thanks for watching.